um, we're in a series talking about reformation. And, and reformation is a word with synonyms of improvement and betterment and correction. And today I want to uh, consider on this Palm Sunday how God would correct and improve our understanding of our experience with Him. That we wouldn't have false expectations that God is in the business of always just giving us instant gratification in a culture that's all about hot and ready. Aren't you glad for Little Caesars, hot and ready? Can I get an amen? All right. It's hard in this culture today to consider the fact that God is not like a genie in a bottle who's just always there to instantly gratify all of our human desires, but that he has a bigger picture in mind, a greater interest in mind in character formation, and he wants to correct any idea of him as just this God that we just come to when we need help, and he'll just instantly gratify it, or we get disenfranchised with him, and we come a little bit indifferent with him, as we see the crowd did on Palm Sunday when he first came, because it's just human nature to want that kind of God. And if we put Jesus in that framework, we're going to be disappointed. And so today I believe that God wants to correct and improve our understanding of our experience of him in a way that will make us better and those around us better and that will fulfill us with pleasures forevermore in his presence. So let's read together in Mark chapter 11. We're going to start in verses 1 through 10 on this story of Palm Sunday. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here to me. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say to them, The Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it back here. They went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of the bystanders were saying to them, what, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them just as Jesus had said, and they gave them permission. And they brought the colt to Jesus and put their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches which they had cut from the fields. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread... Uh, Leafy, oh, I think I just, uh, I had two verses back to back, sorry. And those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming, is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And I want to stop here real quick and kind of give you an understanding of the cultural context and why they're shouting Hosanna and what their words of the son of David mean along with these palm branches. Israel had a prophecy from Zechariah 9.9 that said, Rejoice greatly, shout in triumph, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. And so the people of Israel were expecting a Messiah, a Savior to come from their old covenant days. It was prophesied of this day that one would come riding on the colt, on, on this young boy donkey and so there's this great anticipation around jesus because he's been proving himself in his ministry through healing people through the multiplying of bread for five thousand and those two fish and there's all this excitement he's raised lazarus from the grave and so there's all this anticipation this is him this is the messiah and here he comes fulfilling zechariah 9 9 now on top of that to 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 call him david's son the crowd is saying jesus is the rightful successor to Israel's throne because King David had been their greatest king, the most important king in Israel's history, and the Messiah was to come from his lineage. So they're acknowledging him here. This is the Messiah. This is the one that Zechariah talked about. This is the one of King David's lineage. They're receiving him. This is the rightful king. And by waving then those palm branches, the people are reflecting on what was famously known as the Jewish Maccabean Revolt a Greek, against the Greek Empire's rule. Palm branches had been used at that time as a sign of victory when Judah Maccabeus and his fighters cleansed the temple of the Greek influence and overthrew the Greeks' power at that time. So 
in this picture here of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on this donkey and them crying out, Son of David, Hosanna, and they've got these palm branches, they are expecting him to come and revolt against their new political enemies, Rome. This is a protest against Rome. Deliver us. Hosanna means save now. Right now, Jesus, get it done. Let's go into Jerusalem together and let's overthrow them. Some of that scene was seen on our Capitol right recently where there was this kind of rally and storm on the Capitol. Let's take it back for us. That's kind of the picture of what this crowd is doing and how they're receiving him. Let's continue to read on because what they were expecting is not what, they're, what they ended up getting. In verse 11, then Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple area. And after looking around at everything in the temple, he left for Bethany with his 12 disciples since it was late at that time. The next day when, it, when they had left Bethany, he became hungry. And seeing from a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it to eat. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, though it was the season for figs. And he said to this tree then, may no one ever eat from you again. And his disciples were listening. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple area, and he began to drive out those who were selling and buying on the temple grounds. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple grounds. And he began to teach and say to them, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard this, and they began seeking how to put him to death. For they were afraid of him because the crowd was astonished at his teaching. So here, the one proclaimed to be Israel's king, the one from the line of David, he doesn't go to confront Israel's political enemies. He goes to confront and to turn the tables on Israel's spiritual authorities. How fitting for this time and this day that we're living in, in America, where there's so much political turmoil, where there's so much political tension, where there's so much malice at work that Jesus would go to the, confront the spiritual authorities and not the political authorities. See, I believe that in Jesus' eyes, the greatest threat to the people he loves is not the politicians, it's the spiritual leaders of a nation. I believe that in Jesus' eyes, he is convinced the greatest weapon of mass destruction, it's not the sword and the power that Rome yields, that political powers yield, it's a house defined as a house of prayer. A house of prayer is where true transformation happens. And isn't it interesting that in the house of God today, that represents his name in the nation, you can't hardly call a prayer meeting where anybody will show up. And isn't any wonder then that in the same day in which the prayer meetings are empty, there's so much focus on the political realm and tensions in that arena. What is that an indictment of the church? It shows where our hope lies. It shows who we believe in as our true Messiah and Savior. Who is going to save us? Who is going to come to our rescue? Who can we put our trust in? Prayer tells the story of our hearts. That's where true transformation happens. See, the king of the world, he rides into Jerusalem for his coronation, not on a great steed that the kings of Rome would ride into to show victory, to show the bloodbath of victory they just had, and they would have a line behind them, a procession behind them of all the prisoners that they took. They came with a strong fist to rule over people, but Jesus comes humble on a donkey to come under people, to win their hearts Not to say, hey, not to come with an iron fist, not to come and say, get it together and I'm going to rule over you, I'm going to force my hand on your life. And I'm going to go to the politicians and I'm going to get your, I'm going to force you to do something you don't want. No, he says, I want to come into your heart and I want to transform your heart into my image and likeness in nature. 
He comes on an animal of peace between God and man. Because he wants man conformed into his likeness. And notice the juxtaposition between the beginning of our text and the end of our text. In the beginning of our text, we have someone who, upon hearing that the Lord has need of something, surrenders completely to that need. Oh, the Lord has need of it? Go ahead and take it. But at the end of our passage, we have the religious leaders with the seeds of murder in their hearts toward Jesus for challenging and then overturning their racketeering business. The religious leaders want to put him to death, want to put his voice to death because Jesus is a threat to them being the Lord of their own lives, to their power, to their status with the people, to their popularity. They're more concerned with being popular with people than being popular with God. I, I'm amazed how many people think this book is irrelevant to our day. I open by saying God wants to correct and improve our understanding of how to experience him in a way that will make us and everyone around us better with the fullness of his presence. And I want to remind us today that to experience Jesus regularly in our lives, we must have humility that surrenders everything to his leadership regardless of whether he meets our expectations or not. We secretly in our hearts just want Jesus to put to death everything that's not convenient to us, don't we? Have you ever had that prayer time with Jesus where you're just like, Jesus, if you would just take this person out, if you would just get me out of the circumstance, if you would just do this, if you would just do that, if you would just make my life easy, then, then I'll serve you. Oh, you're not going to do that? Well, I don't really have much time for you, Jesus. You don't make any difference. And so Jesus is ultimately going to have the crowds yelling for his crucifixion when their expectations are not met. Just like the religious leaders want to put him to death in their life, want to put him out of their mind because he's, he's constantly challenging. Who's going to be king? Who are you going to live for? What is this life about anyways? Is this about you? Is this about being popular with people? Is this about your glory? Or is this about the king of kings and the lord of lords in your life? In stark contrast, the owner of the donkeys was freely lending a couple of valuable possessions to the Lord. For the ordinary middle-class family, the donkeys were used for plowing and agriculture as well as service and giving women rides around when you didn't have vehicles. And so it's like Jesus sending people to you and saying, hey, I have need of your lawnmower down the street, that riding lawnmower. It's really nice, I need that. Or I have need of your car. For that person in need down the street, I, I need that. Could you, could you put that into my service? And suddenly there's a test. What or whom is your most valuable possession? See, I like Jesus as long as he doesn't, he doesn't threaten any of my comforts. Well, Jesus, I paid a lot of money for that, and what if they dented, and do they know how to use it, and all these questions, and well, it's going to be inconvenient to go down to one car, and what if I need that mower, and I just can't get it instantly, and we... Well, I just think I'll hold on to it, Jesus, but, you know. What or whom is your most valuable possession? What or whom are you living for? Am I concerned with my status before God or the world? See, the owner of the donkeys was someone who saw Jesus as more valuable than all of their possessions, someone who, more concerned with Jesus' well-being than their own well-being. Jesus was riding in Jerusalem to prove to the people they were his most valuable possession. He's coming as their king to die for them. He's coming to save them from a, a true enemy, Satan's sin and death, that leads to these political powers. But he found out that to many, he wasn't their most valuable possession, even though they were his. I put on the overhead, our hearts can get tied up in possessions, in power, in prestige, in status, all the while missing the fact that the most powerful and prestigious person who sustains the world wants a relationship with us. 
Sorry, Jesus, I don't have time for that because I'm so busy trying to create a status for myself. He says, don't you know who I am? I have all the status. I have all the power. I have all the positions. I rose from the grave and I'm seated in the place where all authority belongs to me and you're so busy chasing what only I can give. The good news is, though all of us have taken advantage of others as the religious people were doing at the temple, charging a lot of money to the Gentiles for getting sacrificial animals to be forgiven of sin, taking advantage of them for their own gain. Though we've all done the same apart from Christ, though we have all been selfish in our own approach for instant deliverance and gratification from God and then maybe getting indifferent or even angry at Him when He doesn't just do what we want when we want, though we've all been diff- you know, guilty of these things, Jesus still rides in with humility knowing they were going to put him to death. Knowing that ultimately they weren't going to understand. Ready to still give himself the greatest treasure of our lives. Knowing that this was what was necessary to give us his nature, his righteousness, his love, joy, and peace. And so I just want you to hear me right now. All of us, we can identify with different characters in the story of Palm Sunday. All of us have lived as our own God, as our own king, have treated Jesus as something that is like just a commodity that exists to just do our bidding. And the second he doesn't do it, feeling as though we have a right now to be dismissive of him. And Jesus still keeps coming and keeps drawing and keeps after us and says, when you're ready, I'm still here. When you're ready, I still want you. I want to show you that greater than the things you're chasing in this world is the creator of all things. I want to show you that if you would just have me and my presence in your life, there is true joy and satisfaction. I can bring with you an adventure and a fullness of life, and I can take of your gifts what little you have to offer, and I can put my blessing on it in such a way, my anointing on it, in such a way that I could use you as my servant, ambassador, representative to bring the kingdom to earth. But if you want to settle for less, I'm not going to force it on you. But when you're ready, I'm here. When we are ready to humbly release our life into his hands, all that we are, all that we have to the king, that's when the spirit of Christ will rest on us as Christ rested on that donkey. You know, that picture of Jesus sitting on that donkey, it's the picture that we get at Pentecost when the flames of fire came down upon the different disciples who had been praying. It says that it sat upon them, it rested on him. See, Christ wants to rest on us. He wants to ride with us into every area of our life, every arena of life. Christ wants to rest on us. He wants to walk beside us. He wants to rule through us. He wants us to take him everywhere we go to reflect his nature and his character and his goodness. Just as this donkey brought him in, to this coronation ceremony. But it takes a willingness to surrender. And you know, it's interesting, the disciples, they brought the mother of this young colt to walk alongside of the colt because the fact that it had never been ridden, it would have been very spooked to have somebody on it and it would have been very spooked to have these large crowds. So they bring the mother donkey to walk beside this young son of its to, to look eye to eye and to walk in this journey together to keep it calm, to keep it from bucking in the midst of what was an anxious moment. And you see, in the same way, Jesus wants us to know that he will reside with us wherever we go. He wants to rule over us and rest on us, and he wants to walk beside us. It's a picture of the Holy Spirit, one who comes alongside of us to help, one who comes alongside of us as the comforter. These are all terms that the Bible uses to present to us the presence of Christ on somebody's life who's treating him as king. You see, wherever Jesus has his way in somebody's life, the kingdom of heaven is there, and the kingdom of heaven is entering into every environment in which it goes. And Jesus is inviting us to coronate him as king 
king in our homes, making our homes a house of prayer. He's, he's wanting to rest upon us and walk beside us into our church, making this building what otherwise wouldn't be more than just a building, a relic, the, the house of God because his presence is with us and his presence is here because we're a praying people, seeking the king, wanting to honor the king, wanting to submit to the king, wanting to be known by our love for each other. He wants to go with us and beside us into our job and he wants his presence, his blessing, his anointing on us so that when everybody else is losing their minds and cheating and lying and acting like these religious leaders, there's an honest person in the place that's preserving some morality, that's preserving the truth that is the salt of the earth that says there's a better way that is the light of the world. You see, Jesus still wants to be written in to every environment in your life. And the question is, are you surrendered to that? Are you open to that? Are you letting the king have his way? Or are you fickle and indifferent and it's just a convenience and he's a commodity? Is he king? Is he truly king in your life? I want you to hear me now as we begin to close. You see, we talk a lot around here about anybody who opens their life to the king, who receives the king into their lives, the living God, a real, living, breathing spirit into their lives who wants to move and bring adventure and joy and power when you receive the Holy Spirit, power to live in love, power to show up on a Saturday at Lanigan Elementary first thing in the morning after a long week of work and, and show the love of Christ to a bunch of kids who, who have nothing else to, to hold on to maybe, that this is the joy of their week to come and show somebody a good time and have lots of fun and games and in Jesus' name say, Happy Easter, we love you. Somebody in this world cares about you. See, if we're going to allow God to have his way with our gifts and our time and our talent and our treasure, we, under, we need to understand the gift is not enough. All of us have gifts, something that's just been given to us for the glory of God. All of us have been given different opportunities to influence different people based on our story, based on our walk our proclivities. We all have different opportunities to bring the kingdom in ways that is unique to each one of us for such a time as this. But just having those gifts and having those opportunities is not enough. It's the choices we make. Jesus comes riding into our lives with humility. He's not going to twist our arm. He's not going to force us. Every day we can wake up and decide to throw off his reign. He has given us the gift of free will. And so I put on the overhead, your gifts don't decide your life, your choices decide your life. You choose each day whether to open your life to Christ and his lordship again. You choose each day whether to be devoted to prayer Remaining humble and dependent, making your house a house of prayer and overflowing with Christ's character and heart. If right now you are dry in your spiritual walk, if right now you are indifferent in your spiritual walk, I want you to hear me right now. You need to at least double your prayer life. You need to get into the presence of God and be seeking God. You were never meant to do it on your own. You are to be intimate with him. You are to have your heart knit together with him. You are to every morning turn back to him and say, Lord Jesus, I need you. Oh, Lord Jesus, I need you to fill me full with your love, with your joy, with your peace. Lord Jesus, I need you to help me today with my mouth and my attitude and my spirit towards my enemies. Lord Jesus, if I'm going to honor you today with my eyes, I need you, Lord Jesus, to to rest on me afresh and anew. I need your power. Jesus made our life to be interdependent with his every single day, and that's a choice we make. You choose, then, whether to work hard, making every effort to work out what the king is working in. We're called to make every effort to work out what Jesus is working in. It's not just gonna happen by accident. 
It starts with prayer, and prayer energizes us, and prayer makes the presence of Christ manifest in us, and prayer is what checks us when we're getting out of step with God. Prayer is something that should be as natural as breathing air that we do throughout the day, but that we also have focused times for where we have to turn off all the noise, and we have to get alone with God, and we got to just be in His presence We are not human doers. We are human beings. And we have got to just be with the king in order to become effective in our doing. And we cannot get that out of order if it's going to be done with the spirit of Christ and the love of Christ. And that's a choice that we make. Regardless of how gifted you are, regardless of, of all the, way, the charisma you have, the competencies you, you have, you could be the smartest person in this room and you could make us all logically look like fools and you could have tons of charisma, but you still need the spirit of the living God if you're going to build his kingdom. If you're going to be effective. If you're going to love people well, if you're not going to end up taking advantage of people like these religious people, nobody was more devoted than the Pharisees and the scribes. Nobody was smarter, book smart wise, than the the Pharisees and the scribes. And nobody had a darker heart than the Pharisees and the scribes. You know why? Because pride is the mother of all sins. Jesus rides in with humility. Humility. And he asks us to humbly accept him as king and let him rule and, and guide and direct our lives, and pride cuts him off. It cuts off heaven's door. Humility is the hinge that opens the door of heaven, and pride is the hinge that closes the door of heaven in your life. They call carbon monoxide the silent killer, where you need a carbon monoxide detector everywhere you go to pick up this invisible thing that will actually kill you. Pride is the spiritual killer. It says, I don't, I'll just do this independent of God. I got this, God. It goes into any day thinking, I don't need you, Jesus. I got it. I know. I know. Jesus says, in and of yourself, you can do nothing. I need a house of prayer. Let me close by saying this. You choose a life of ease, making it all about you, or you choose to trust Jesus with a life of service and adventure, knowing the king loves you and wants to share his ministry with you. Never before in the history of the world has it been easier to just decide, you know what, I'm just going to live a life of ease. Why would I sacrifice so much? You know what? Why would I even bring kids into this world? I mean, they're really kind of inconvenient and, and messy and demanding. And you know, I, I want to make life an adventure for me. I want it to be all about me. I want to be the center. And I just want everything to come easy and comfortable. And, oh, a cross at the center? Self-sacrifice? Serving the greatest among you will be the servant of all. You want me, even Lord Jesus, to ride in amongst these fickle who one day will, will sing my praises, and the next day, when I don't do their bidding, say crucify him. You want me to still love them and serve them and pray for them and bless them if you want to belong to me. You can choose to come, and we'll welcome you with open arms, and we'll love you and bless you in this church. Come as you are, absolutely. You never have to plug in, get accountability. You don't really have to be known. You never have to serve a day in your life here, and and you're going to get all the benefits. We're still going to pray for you, and we're going to love you, and we're going to serve you, and we're going to make, we want you to see the goodness of God, but understand it's so that you can fulfill your purpose in him. And if you never plug in, and you never are known, and you never uh, seek to serve with the gifts that he's given you, you're missing out on fullness of life. You live a shallow existence. There is no fullness of joy there. There comes a point in your walk with God where you got to decide, is it going to just be about chasing materialism and money and status like the Pharisees and scribes? 
Is it just going to be about political overthrow and a nice, comfortable existence? As long as me and my family are safe and, 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 and you know, we have all the walls and protection up around us, then I'm okay. But God, don't ever ask me to step out and be vulnerable or step out in, in, into a dangerous, uncomfortable place for me. Soft limits. You got to be honest with yourself. Who's the king? You haven't yet coronated him as king. And I'm asking you to do something really hard. I want you to get real, and I want you to get honest. And I want you to face where you're really at with Jesus today. Is he king of your life? If he comes to you and says, I have need of this, no matter what it is, I have need of your, your tithe. I have need of your house. I have need of your vehicle. I have need of your time to plug into this group at church. I have need. Of, is there anything off limits? Or do you have the attitude and the spirit and the heart that so trusts him and loves him and knows his goodness that says, oh, the Lord has need of it? You got it. Absolutely. Oh, man, the Lord has need of it? Oh, it's so good to serve the Lord. I love him so. He has been so good. to. He died to save me from my sin. He's got me going to heaven. He has eternal reward for me. If the Lord has need of it, I'm all in. And you see how simple this is? It's not what Ben Walls needs. It's not what Hilltop needs. You have one voice to listen to, the Lord's voice. You can say no all day long, to anything that doesn't fit you and suit you, the question is, does Jesus have the final say? If he has need of it, will you say yes, no matter what the cost? In that person is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore because where the presence of the Lord rests on somebody, where the anointing is on somebody, there is blessings and pleasures forevermore, and everybody around them is blessed. When the spirit of the living God is present, there is gentleness and love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Oh, man, that's the kind of people I want to hang out with. And Jesus says, I'm here to whomsoever will. He wants this, and he has enabled you to come. And some of you, you need to loose your stubborn heart. You're, you're, you're stubborn as a donkey. You've tied up some possessions that he, he wants in your life, whether that be a relationship he wants you to let go of, some entertainments and hobbies that are not reflecting his character in your life, time management issues you're tied up and man you're you're holding on for dear life and and that holy spirit is there trying to loose your grip and say you can trust me you can trust me i love you you can trust me let me rest on you let me ride with you let me come beside you let me compel your life and use your gifts and graces to do immeasurably more than you could ever ask or imagine in blessing others and bringing others along into this presence of mine. And so you choose. Will you have regret? Will you get to the end of your life and you'll say, oh, I should have, I should have done more for Jesus. I, I played it safe. I never stepped out in faith. I always did the secure, easy route. I just made it about Netflix and Amazon and, and just doing my own little thing in my own little hub here. I never stepped out in faith to my neighbors. I never got to know anybody's name. I never showed up to any of the ministry events. I just wanted to play it. E you know, that's uncomfortable. It's easier here in my own little world. Or you're going to get to the end and you're going to say, you know what? I poured it all out. I gave it my all, Jesus. And you are so worthy of everything I got. And yeah, I, I stepped in it many times and I made a lot of mistakes. And oh man, my ego took some hits because here I thought I had it and I, I got ahead of you, God, and it wasn't you. But, but you know what? You stayed faithful and you picked me back up and you, you taught me how to pray first and stay in step with your old spirit. I mean, I went for it. And he says, oh, well done. Good and faithful servant. 
The Lord has need of you. And he comes in peace. He doesn't want to condemn. He doesn't want to beat you up. He's challenging, and maybe he's correcting, but he loves you. And he wants to use you for his kingdom and his purposes. So loose every treasured possession outside of him and let him be the king of your life and let him show you the fullness of his presence for you, your family, and everyone around you becoming better. For in his presence is fullness, joy. Heavenly Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, we recognize in our own lives how fickle we can be. We're so grateful for the authenticity of, of your disciples and all the ways they failed you before then this crowd comes hailing you as king, comes declaring you as the Messiah, and then very quickly is turning on you when you don't do their bidding, as they understand. And yet, Lord, you were doing a deeper work. You were doing a greater grace. You were enabling them to come to the throne of grace and receive the fullness of your presence. And I pray that, God, anybody here that doesn't know the treasure that you are, that doesn't see you as greater than every created thing, that doesn't see that you are our greatest possession, that it's all about you, Lord. It's all about you coming and being one with the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and that, Lord, the greatest and most amazing calling of our lives and status is to be your representatives to have you walking with us, to have your anointing us, to have our gifts at work with your power and your grace in your ministry that ends in great reward. God, I just pray you open the eyes of our heart to know your reward and your power, to know the fullness of your presence, to know that we need to make the most of the time we've been given. And if we've been just playing it safe, and we've just been taking a life of ease and comfort. And we're not stepping out to give our all for you. The Lord, we're going to have regret in the end. So Lord Jesus, on this Coronation Sunday, I pray for anybody who is not fully surrendered to your kingship, that today would be the day where they take their hands off. They untie their possessions and put them in your hands. They untie their gifts and put them in your hands. They untie their time and put it in your hands and say, my life is yours. Take it for the glory of your name. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.